There's, there's something about that. We'll I'll start in a moment. I'm okay, I just down. hit the record button. So okay, if you great. are if you're on video and you don't want to be on video, you can turn yourself off. That's not a problem. Oh, but not the speakers. <laughs> we'll be here. Okay, I think I'm gonna start. Is that cool? Yeah, I think we're ready. Okay. Hey, hi everyone. I'm Meredith from Meredith Rosen Gallery. Thanks so much for joining us for this painting conversation with Susan Chen, Gina Beavers, Heba Shabazz, and hosted by Yasi Alipour. I want to introduce our host, Yasi. She was born in 1989 in Iran. She received an MFA from Columbia in 2018. She's an artist and a writer and currently lives in Brooklyn. And she's currently in the Sharp Alenta Studio Program and also has a show up in a group exhibition at devils-lake.com. You should totally check out. So I'll let you take it from there. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks to everyone who came. Thank you, Meredith and Susan for including me in this talk. Uh, and much thanks to Hiba and Gina for accepting our invitation. I must say, since the talk is officially on painting, I'm gonna leave it to these amazing three painters to take over that part. I feel like I have to start with saying, I, I will be the non-painter in this conversation, but I believe they can take that over. Uh, I'm gonna start with a brief intro uh, to each of these incredible women and then we'll jump right in. Uh, so Susan, um, who's currently having her first solo exhibition with the Meredith Gallery, uh, which I highly recommend, was born in Hong Kong. She's a first generation Asian American who grew up between Hong Kong and UK during the Hong Kong handover uh, before immigrating to US. She has a BA from Brown University uh, and recent, are you finishing your MFA next year or this year? Um, I feel like it's still up in the air. Some of us are graduating in October and some of us okay. are graduating in the spring. So we're, will, we're figuring it out. She's part of the generation that is kind of graduating in this absurd current moment, but uh, another Columbia University MFA. Um, she has received many awards, including the AXA Art Prize. Her work has been featured in the New American Paintings. Obviously, uh, her show is currently on view at Meredith and Rosen Gallery. Gina Beavers uh, was born in Athens, Greece. Uh, she's working in Newark, New Jersey. It's been fascinating how much people cover your move to Newark. <laughs> uh, she has a BA in studio art and anthropology from University of Virginia, an MFA from SAIC, and a master's in education from Brooklyn Co College. Um, I'm gonna read that sentence that kind of describes your work just to give a sense before we get started. Uh, she creates paintings and installations from photos called from the internet and social media and rendered in high acrylic relief. Series include paintings based on the creative realms of body painting. I love this part. Social media users photo of their meals, AKA food porn, uh, makeup tutorials, uh, and bodybuilder selfies. Uh, her work is in the collection of the Whitney Museum, Tel Aviv Museum of Art, ICA Miami. Um, her work has been reviewed by New York Times, Art Forum, Art in America, Freeze, Modern Painters, uh, New Yorker, many other places. Uh, as many of you hopefully know and had a chance to experience, her institutional show, The Life of I Deserve, was at MoMA PS1 in 2019. And she has an upcoming show at Marion Boesky Gallery in September. I feel like you three are the only three artists that are currently having like a show in person starting now. <laughs> uh, and she has a show that will open in Seoul in 2021. Heba Shabazz was born in Karachi, Pakistan, and lives in Brooklyn. Uh, she works with paper, black tea, and water-based pigments. Uh, she depicts women's bodies while referencing self-portraiture, creating a space for herself and other women to tell their stories and reclaim their histories. Since migrating to the US, her practice has expanded from miniature painting to human scale, works on paper, 
Shabazz is trained in miniature painting at the National College of Art in Lahore and received an MFA from Pratt Institute. Her solo show, The Garden, was uh, at Spring Break Art Show in 2018. Um, she has shown uh, in many places and has created exhibition in Pakistan and India. She has been a resident at Mass Mocha, a Scythe Project, Vermont Studio Center, and many other places. She teaches miniature, which I find really intriguing. And she has a show coming up at Deepak, Deepak Gallery in September 2020. So you all have the chance to see all of these women's work if you happen to be in New York. With that, welcome to the talk. Um, thank you for accepting our invitation. Glad, glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. Like, laughs> thank you for taking over. <laughs> um, so I'm going to jump in uh, with my questions. It's been an interesting challenge to think about how we're going to tackle this talk, as I think there are questions each of you ask really deeply in your work and in different ways. So I'm gonna ask with the, perhaps the most general and basic one. Um, I think each of you identify as female painters and deal with figuration one way or the other. I personally am really interested in how each of you deal with the marginalized body, which is a subject I've been thinking a lot about both the politics of marginality and what it means to think about the body itself. So let's start with the figure. Any thoughts on, my questions are, will be very vague. Hopefully you will help me ramble on. Any thoughts on the figure and how you turn to it? Please jump in when you feel comfortable. Or I can name names if you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, quick question. Did you so want, did you want the screen share to be shared? I wasn't yeah, sure. Yeah, that would actually yes? be great. Okay. So people can uh, get a sense uh, of your work too. Thank you. Um, and now, Susan, you have to go because you're the first one. Okay, wait, what was the question again? <laughs> so, um, how did you turn, like, thinking about yourself as a contemporary painter, as a female painter who asks a lot of questions about identity and the body, what is your relationship to the figure? Yeah, so I think for me, um, I think I was, I sort of entered into painting uh, through the landscape. And when I was starting my MFA, I thought um, I wanted to use the time to do basically the complete opposite because I thought I have all this help from my professor and my friends, like what is the opposite of running, running away? And I thought portraiture was like the total opposite because there's like a real human in front of you and or yourself and you can't really get away from it. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, when I first started, I wasn't, it wasn't like intentionally like I am going to commit fully to representation because that's a pretty big statement and a pretty big sort of like pressure to put on yourself to be like, I am um, going to, I don't know, like uplift an entire community. That's like a pretty mm. big, um, I don't know, like a statement to put out there. But, um, but as I kept going along, I realized, well, especially because I had put out a post to, um, to paint sitters and then I had like a flood of almost a hundred emails and that's sort of when I realized that mm. this was like a, a thing that was bigger than myself mm. um and you know um just like thinking about um representation or like portraiture and art history where mm. it often depicts you know gods or wealthy socialites people who are mm. worth remembering um, and then to think about how just like Asian Americans in U.S. history have often been erased, um, like the Chinese Exclusion Act in 82 or the Japanese internment camps during World War II or even just like Trump's immigration policies right now that blocks out grad students who are coming from Asia. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, during my MFA, there are like three really distinct memories I remember, just like Crazy Rich Asians, the movie came out, mm. it was like the first Hollywood film with a full Asian cast um, that had come out in 25 years. Um, and then um, I remember being at the Art Institute in Chicago when the Charles mm. White exhibition was up in mm -hmm. 2018, I think. 
Um, but also like during my MFA, just realizing that I didn't have even like one Asian female painter, like apart from my peers who are my age, like come through for a studio critique. Mm. Um, and just like realizing that, I don't know, it's weird about like humans, I guess, like when you see yourself, mm. um, it does psychologically affect you. Mm. One of the reasons why I was so fascinated with our conversation is because I feel like you each deal with these questions in such radically different ways. And I told everyone we're going to jump in deep instantly. Uh, but Gina, your relationship with bodies completely different, um, or perhaps the quest question isn't necessarily about representation. Um, do you want to introduce your work a bit before we... Uh, sure. This piece is a, a drawing. It's like a study for a painting um, that I just, I put together thinking about memes, uh, bodily kinds of memes. Um, and I just, I, part of it is photographed and part of it is just Photoshop. Um, but this is sort of a pandemic drawing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. Like that was a really desperate cry for help or something. But I feel like um, that's part of your work. Yeah. So bitter, I mean, laughter. yeah, I mean, what's weird about this piece when I think about the body is like, you know, like that's actually me and like, I'm really, really pale. Um, and so there's like some sense of like the whiteness of the figure mm. being kind of in your face. And mm. I, I started to look at like this figure is holding a skull or like giving birth to death mm. in a way, mm. but is also, you know, death is like groping the figure as well. Mm. So it's like sort mm. of a, a kind of particularly white woman position mm. where you're sort of a victim, but you're also, mm. um, a, you know, a bad, a bad force and mm. you're also, mm. a you know, like, like yeah. it's, Middle, middle ground. Um, that's really fascinating because I think there's a lot of writing around your work that thinks about social media and our relationship with social media. But I feel like, especially in the past couple of months, I think we're beginning to realize the politics of social media and how we may experience it differently based on race um, and class and ethnicity and all the other shit show we deal with. Um, so it's, it's fascinating because I feel like that question of authorship and agency as female artists, like all of you ask those questions in different ways. Um, I don't know, I appreciate um, keep facing or dancing with it somehow. Um, Hiba, hi. <laughs> um, so then I'm interested in uh, the body and especially the figure in your work and how it came to be. Do you want to give us a general intro to your work? Sure. Um, well, I started, I started, I came into painting with the body, like completely opposite from Susan. Um, I was never into landscape. I think I'm more into landscape mm. now. Mm. Um, but yeah, I was drawing myself since I was a kid. Just, um, sorry, I don't have headphones which go into my computer. <laughs> I think we're hearing you fine. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was like drawing myself uh, since I was like a teenager, just in my bedroom. And um, that was my first kind of interaction with figurative art, I guess. Mm -hmm. It never really stopped in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I ended up going to college, um, I was specifically like training as a miniature painter. And even then I was painting like really, really, really tiny little bodies, like mm. two, three inch bodies, um, but with no face. I was like a faceless body painter. Uh, and then like that kind of evolved into these um, life-size figures, which I'd kind of always seen in my mind, but never mm. really managed to kind of get out of the whole tradition of miniature painting because I was so I was like oh I have to like do this and it's so important to dying art and all of this mm. stuff and uh but then that kind of broke through I guess a few years mm. ago that's so fast I'm like yes wait you said you're going to return to it later um but your push and pull with uh figuration is really fascinating because I think a lot of times when we sit in New York and we talk about 
figurative painting, we don't really think about different histories of the body in painting that isn't necessarily the individual. And now your work is doing a lot of push and pull there. Um, so if we can move to the next, uh, thank you. So for my next questions, I had some thoughts kind of moving forward with the idea of um, questioning of self and identity and the body in, in each of your work and how it comes together. Right before the talk started, I was looking at all like your upcoming shows. And for me, I was like, oh, like your titles are on point and kind of covers a lot of what I want to say. So Susan, the, your exhibition is titled On Longing. Gina, yours mm -hmm. is World War Me. And Heba, yours is Dreaming. Yeah. I was like, of course it is. Of course it is. <laughs> like, all of it was so on point. But what I'm interested in there, I thought it was fascinating that in each of your works, you think about self not as only your individual experience, but how it translates politically, socially, and like in a larger scale. So, uh, Susan, I know with this body of work, it kind of, for this exhibition, you practice kind of like shifted to the pandemic. Uh, but for a while, you were working with these different forums uh, online like the, correct me if I'm wrong, the Subtle Asian Traits, was that the name of the group? Who does the name it? Um, where you observe these communities and then reached out for the paintings and you have these moments where you're sitting with your, then you have life sitters. So you have these like longer interactions with these people you don't know. And then I think within that you start questioning that's like, what is it? that is understood as the Asian American experience. So there's something about that conversation. And um, if we can go to the next image, um, there's something, there's this book that is in this work and you mentioned books that you interest, you're interested in too, this book called The Racial Melancholia, Racial Dis Disassociation. Uh, which talks about the social and the psyche of the Asian American experience. But those two words seem very fascinating, especially with your work and the, how the people appear in your work. So I'm going to like throw a shit ton of thoughts about all three of your work and then maybe hopefully you three can take over. So in your work, Susan, I'm interested um, in that melancholia or that sense of longing and kind of aiming to understand the Asian American experience by these um, together comings. And then Gina, on some levels in a similar way, you have worked with social media a lot and algorithms of that social media gives you, basically what they suggest, what you put together. And there's a lot about like the makeup tutorials, the, uh, the beauty, the online beauty culture, there's something about like the DIY, but like obviously a big part of your work is the sense of curiosity and humor in repeating these images. Um, so, so I was interested in um, the self being made in the social way, like how like our understanding of self is performed online. And then Heba, your work deals with the idea of, this is a reference image that you submitted and I really love. And it, Ended oh, up finding did, its yeah. way here. <laughs> Sorry. We we're supposed to take it out. No, I love it. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm glad it's here because, like, a lot of times you find inspiration through images you find online that are fairly obscure. Yeah. Uh, and then, Keba, in your work, um, there's all these like myths. Like, it almost feels like you're creating your own mythology with these figures. Um, and especially thinking about miniature, how it's like, we don't have tech, so you invite us in these worlds where we have to fill uh, what this female figure is going through, what is the mythology? So any takes on melancholia, humor, mythology, or your works? Yeah, I guess yeah. I could start. Um, and well, well, first, I do not know what the Asian American experience is. It's very hard to say, like, one person fits all. Um, mm -hmm. I was really fascinated by this book 
mostly because there aren't that many books in the field. It's kind of a relatively new field, like with race and ethnicity mm. studies. Like at Yale, it only became a department in 2019. And at, at Columbia, it's still like a center. It's not like an actual department yet. Mm. Um, but anyway, I was really lucky to be able to take a class with one of the authors. Um, and so um, like in the book, like, melancholia was just like initially defined by Sigmund Freud the um psychoanalysis like psychologist guy <laughs> um as um basically this sense of mourning um mm. and with a lot of Asian Americans who moved to the states I mean just in general like usually when you're mourning you're able to like come to a place where you um you're able to find closure essentially mm. and I think with a lot of Asian Americans that closure uh, never really happens um, mm. and the book goes on to argue like all these different ways like why that is like whether it's mm. like assimilation or like post-immigration trauma like mm. people who come from the Vietnam War or just mm. like intergenerational differences in culture mm. between like first generation immigrants and their children and the language barriers. Um, oh, can I jump in for a second. So like, I think that's really interesting and something I find fascinating in their work is like kind of this argument of the melancholic experience of the first generation and then the dissociated experience of the second generation. I'm more interested in these communities you create. If you can go to the image before this. So this one for me is a really fascinating painting and you talked about, I think in one of your recent interviews about how you ended up meeting this group because they were all supporters of Andrew Yang and it's like, it's the first time you're meeting and the painting is coming together. Uh, but by the time you were finishing the painting, Andrew Yang was no longer in the race. So there's also like, that hope is already over in a way. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in this sense of like, what is off center in your figures like from the gaze between the different models to just like how they're settled there um yeah tell us more about the painting like uh what do you mean by the off-centered they're hard, hard to they're hard to stay with for me it's fascinating at points i'm like the look is just like blank other times i'm like oh it's a melancholic gaze and then the other times it feels like silence so it's like there's a lot about the unspoken that i have to fill mm -hmm. you don't ask me question i ask you question yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no i actually went to quite a few canvassing and um signature gathering events and i always thought it was really interesting how they were like quite awkward you know i think mm -hmm. there is like this lack of confidence when you're supporting a candidate who people aren't like not a lot of people are, like they're not the majority. And um, I don't know, that awkwardness and that doubt. And um, it's kind of like when you're like that one kid at the playground who like no one mm. wants to play with you type thing. Mm. And I don't know, I was like trying to bring that into the painting in some mm. ways. And actually when I first started the painting, I wanted this like really cool night scene like with Radio City, but then he like dropped out of the race like midway in the painting. And I was like, no, like, <laughs> like how am I gonna finish this? Like suddenly it feels relevant. Mm. But then actually I felt like it was, it more became even more like, mm. I don't know, in tune with um, kind of like how, what I was feeling at these yeah. events. Um, it was like the sense of like a lost hope. And so it's, I like changed the colors to these like kind of like dreamy blues or something. It's fascinating how it, that echoes your complicated relationship with representation and power too. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of awkwardness, uh, Gina, any take on humor <laughs> um, yeah. and curiosity? Yeah. Um, and also well, I was thinking with yeah. Gina's work, like also with social media and desire, mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. so much, and like, I don't know, like desire in my work with social media and also the way that like Gina approaches it. It's different, but like social media and desire, like one on one, you know? Yeah, totally. I was just going to say that someone had commented when I posted this painting, like, that's a really thirsty painting. And I was like, yeah, I mean, 
<laughs> I like I like that idea of the painting being really thirsty and it's kind of a thread through you know the makeup tutorials and things that I've done where the painting is looking at you while it makes itself and it wants you to like it you know this idea mm. of like trying to be liked um mm. Is, is different from say, you know, abstract expressionist painting where it's like, I'm the coolest one in the room. Watch me do, you know, like yeah. watch me be cool. You know, this is like, please like me. You know, it's like very desperate in a certain kind of way. Yeah. Um, yeah mm. So, I, I mean, I don't, I just, I guess the humor comes in where I just have like uh, ideas for things that are just like dumb ideas. But if I have an idea, I will just make it. Um, mm. I don't. I don't get too precious. I don't. You know. So, a lot of times, it it brings up some jokes. You know, like the jokes come up. You know. I mean, that's also fascinating because, like, I don't know. I think in my head, I'm kind of stuck on this idea of how to how to actually challenge power. So there's something yeah. from like the abbots, like I am significant. Respect yeah. me. To right. Right. Life is awkward. Uh, yeah. It's okay to slap with this, mm -hmm. or just even the sense of please like me, mm -hmm. um, which is also it seems to me a big part of being a marginalized artist too. It's like you're mm -hmm. constantly negotiating that space. For sure. Um, yeah. Hiba, your paintings for me it seems like it comes from such an intuitive space too. It's like it's kind of like a a different world where one can exist. Um, yeah, tell me about mythology or awkwardness if you want. Um, yeah, so I don't know if I feel very awkward. Mm. I definitely, uh, I, I like, I feel I'm generally very hermetic just as a, a person. So when I also, when I paint and my entire life and mind is so in, like it's so inward. And so a lot of um, a lot of the paintings are made from like a weirdo inner space and like this some kind of strange dream world. Like I can see something, like I can see this. Uh, these are dying, but I, when I paint them, these will be like so beautiful and luscious, be, like wrapped yeah. around my face. Yeah. It's just kind of become like this weird way on, on how I see see life and I think now that we're talking about it I haven't thought about it a whole lot before but I think like part of it might be because as a kid I just spent so much time like fake creating my world I, I had I spent so much time at home my family was super conservative so there was no like going out with friends after school or hanging out or you know all of these things and so there was a lot of alone time and like every room in the house was like a different like space um mm. and especially like books because my mom was a librarian and we we mm. had a, a library um like just reading growing up reading all these books like Enid Blyden and Mr. Galliano Circus like every every sofa was a caravan so it's just like Constantly since I was a kid, I was just always like creating these imaginary spaces to exist in. And when mm. I got older and life got a, li a little a little more stressful, um, then I just like started hyper creating fake mm. spaces because I think it became like a coping mechanism or something. Mm. And um, I have this ridiculous desire all the time to just make everything perfect and beautiful. And I think mm. that's also the miniaturist because a lot of mm. the rules of Eastern art, there is so much, um, uh, there's such an elevation of beauty mm. and of perfection and the idea of perfection and harmony mm. and spirituality, harmony and colors and mm. elevation of nature. Everything is painted and like, not an exact representation but it is mm. supposed to be a representative of so like mm. the cup is not supposed to be painted realistically it has to be painted so it looks like a cup but you're not competing with god if you paint it mm. like, all these like things uh, it gets dramatic really fast <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. uh, i feel like yeah i feel like i can joke 
about it a bit just because I'm Iranian. Oh, yes. Like it's, an, it's an insider joke. Um, <laughs> no, but it's also fascinating, especially after um, thinking about Gina's work, I feel like your work gives space. It's like it's kind of inviting to be in this world. Um, but also I'm really curious working with the, the legacy of miniature painting that is often like really stuck with text or the authorship, like the gravity of text. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm really curious about like the whole culture of the written text around the region and how the miniature would be for someone who maybe couldn't access it. But if you yeah. could read the text, you had more authorship, you would know more. And I love that your work is kind of like really free of that. Like, I don't know what is happening with this mythical creature, like with this woman. Um, but she's kind of given her word. Before we move to my next question, something that is interesting for me in all three of your work, and I'm interested in hearing more, is um, we don't have to go to next images. Thank you. We can like kind of uh, move toward through what we have. Um, I'm interested. And obviously, Gina, Susan, your work thinks about social media in a very specific way. I was thinking about space in your work. Um, but hey, well, yours is fascinating too, because like you talk a lot about the gardens uh, in miniature painting, but how much more than being interested in the garden itself, you're fascinated in giving this woman a space. She's like mm -hmm. a lot of times filled with a void. Um, any ideas about voids and social media? Or you can totally reject my question. Any, any ideas about? Void or, or space, giving space and social media. Um, or contemporary yeah, space. Yeah, I think like, um, I mean, for me, social media was so terrifying initially because I, I was painting in the closet until I was 30. Um, I never shared my work. I was constantly trying to hide it. Mm -hmm. And when I moved here a few years later, I realized if I have to be an artist, I have to be online, there has to be a website, mm -hmm. my mom is going to see it. Oh my God. Oh. Um, and so when I did the whole social media thing, it was uh, kind of like ripping off a band aid. Mm -hmm. And I think just like I create like the space for women in my paintings. I kind of have created that space in the studio for women. Mm. Um, and uh, like I grew a garden there. I like made a cut out garden. And then I, I like to share that space. And a lot of women come and visit me in that space mm. and they tell me their stories and that like mm. whole space has become so um, charged uh, in a way. Um, mm. And I'm not, I remember earlier when you sent your questions, you were like, you're not like weird about social media and stuff. And I'm, I'm not like, I find it to be this kind of amazing mm. point of connection between all of mm. us, like mm. especially as an artist who just kind of showed up. I had no idea what was going on. I went mm. online and I was like, hey. <laughs> um, I, I like I met most of the art world online and mm. just like, because I work so isolated, I feel mm. like this, super um it gives me a real kind of space to mm. to actually have that back mm. and forth a little bit um it's really fascinating susan i i don't think you're kind of in between studios but reading interviews with you heba and gina people talk about your studios and how much they enjoyed being in your studios so much like there's like paragraph after paragraph of just like enjoying being in your space uh, Gina, in your recent interview with AJ Hauser at The Rail, you kind of, there was one image of someone placing uh, these masks on like a towel. And you were saying that oh, you're yeah. kind of curious about like yeah. that kind of a staging. Yeah. Um, which for me became a stand in for your relationship with space and social media in a really weird mm -hmm. way. Um, yeah. Well, I think it's, uh, I know I've been really interested in how, you know, all of these images of like the cropped body, um, whether it's hands or, you know, thighs, there used to be this meme about like, are those hot dogs or thighs, 
right? There's all this like bodily imagery, but it's all very, very close up and cropped. And I mean, I think part of that is a function of the camera being close to, you know, people taking, you know, maybe not, it's it's selfie culture kind of, but it's also just like the proximity of this camera to your body Mm -hmm. at all times. So your feet, you know, Mm -hmm. people take pictures of their feet. So Mm -hmm. I, that, that influences like, you know, a lot of the ways that I conceive of these paintings or find images. Um, I recently have done some like maybe further away body and it's like feels freaky to me because I'm so in this world of like this up close. Mm. um, In a really weird way just reminded me I recently had like a new meeting with a therapist through Zoom and I was like we are way too close to each other. (laughs) There's something where I'm like I just like I need to step back. This is not an office. I'm right here. Uh, But Susan like off of that thought I think it's so interesting that a lot of times with your sitter the space that you're drawing is like that space where the two of you might spend like six hours together and this is your first meeting and have like this whole like intense relationship and then it all goes off even though your initial conversation is this in this non-space called social media um any any thoughts on space in your work susan Yeah, I mean, it is strange to find sitters on social media. Sometimes, I mean, I think people have way better privacy settings than I do. And sometimes I don't, like, I can't really see their profile picture. So I literally have no idea what they look like until um, they rock up. Or it's like, they have like these sort of like Tinder profiles where they're like, you know, like really, like everyone wants to put their best selves out there. And then when they rock up, they're just like, in like not like t-shirts but you just like never know what to expect but it is weird going from like not knowing someone at all to being like I'm gonna stare at you for Mm. five hours like into your soul Mm. um and then like after it's like going on one of those like one-time dates but then it's like really Mm. intense um but then like you have this like you build up this list and then like after 20 people Mm. you're like I just can't go on these like hardcore dates anymore but um (laughs) thinking about like I think for me, it's like social media is so fascinating in that like world population is the largest it has ever been. And, Mm. you know, we're all on this platform and everyone's trying to find their like little niche in the world. And I Mm. think there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Mm. Um, And, um, oh yeah, thinking about just like, um, these sort of like windows on your phone that allow you to like escape into this different place. Um, just temporarily or Mm. that you can be anyone you want to be on like Mm. online but then like you could be just someone totally different like on Mm. the other side. Something Um, I find really fascinating in your work that makes me think about Elisa Niesenbaum's work too it's how you pay attention because there's like you give equal attention to everything from like the figure to everything surrounding it and there's like a intense flattening but also like thinking about meaning in everything that surrounds or how the painting unravels for me that makes me both think about your complicated relationship with um the questions of identity and then how you deal with this space or this desire um any more thoughts on space shall i move to my next question um i guess i could say something yeah sure i guess like talking about space and in paintings, like mm-hmm. not in not in social media or stuff. Yeah. I've been thinking about that a lot. I'm sure this is a consideration for all the painters. It's like, I think we all depict space in our paintings so differently. Mm-hmm. Um, like Gina was saying, hers are like so many close-ups and now she's moved a, a little further away. And Susan's are a little more like you can see all the details, Radio City in the background and like all the t-shirts and there's like a lot of amazing stuff uh, going on and then I just paint everything red. Like I don't know what's up with that, like how we Mm. are all kind of relating to this in this weird way. It's like Mm. we're all working with the body, right? But we're Mm -hmm. all seeing it totally different. Anyway, 
that was just no no that was great yeah. i'm like no, i'm really done he was asking the questions yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, well i think yeah i think it's i'm i'm always really interested like um uh in the negative space around figures and uh it, it becoming sort of like a psychological space mm. in a certain kind of way um i think about um oh my gosh i'm totally blanking on the painter's name. I'll have to write it. But uh, yeah, so I mean, just the fact that there, you know, maybe nothing or just a color or something like that, mm. it still has such a weight, you know, it still yeah. has such a, um, so interesting to me, yeah. Hmm. Actually, I did just think of one more thing with regards to space, but um, I think like in a lot of my work, there's often like a landscape outside the window mm. or in the background. And I think a lot about how like, I'm just thinking about like the window paintings that Matisse made um, during mm. World War II or like Bonnard and his sort of landscapes out the window and how it is about this like sense of longing. It's like, you know, like mm. I'm here, but I'd rather be there. And there's a lot of that mm. in landscapes, I feel like. Mm. Um, mm. That's so nice. Anyway. Like yeah. <laughs> See, that's why I'm like, I think painters should uh, ask, follow up on my questions, because I feel like there's something so intimate with being a painter or making in that way. Um, in a really weird way, I think it's fascinating, too, in our initial conversation. Um, Susan, you obviously think a lot about what it means to be Asian American. And hey, but I think in your work, you're... Um, like South Asian identity kind of comes through with like the practice, the medium itself, tea. Sorry, I'm an Iranian and I get to make tea jokes. We love tea. <laughs> it's a thing, it's a serious thing. <laughs> tea is real. Um, I'm drinking coffee to be cool. Um, and Gina, you already talked about this, like um, even with your first work, to think about rather than universalizing your experience, thinking about what it means to think about it today. So what you said, Susan, kind of made me think about um, that sense of longing and different, like thinking about space in that way too. Like what is the immigrated body? What is the experience of marginalization? But before I go on rambling about this, because I'm like, this is a black hole, Yasi, you're going, you're going deep. Um, something I found really interesting, which is like another thing that repeats in all three of your practices, but in such different ways, is the relationship of your work to self-portraiture. Susan, uh, can we have the screen again? Do we know? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Susan, you started working on these kind of also demanded by the current situation um, because COVID and then you no longer could work with your models and you started uh, doing these self-portraits. I'm really taken, it's like there's something you mentioned in your interviews that I find really intense and significant in how you deal with self-portraiture and said much more than like being empowering or a question of beauty it was about like doubt and awkwardness. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes in your paintings with others too, but very intensely here. Um, and then if we can go to the next image. It was so good. Someone was posting this today with like all the different deadlines, like uh, details, like, oh, the Fauci. Um, and if we can go to the next one. And um, Gina, I just like double checked with you before this, but you mentioned in your interview with EJ how sometimes um, these collages you take that are inspired by like makeup tutorials and art history, whether it's the nails or the mouth or um, the eyelids. Um, a lot of times you use parts of your own body. So there's something yeah. about the presence of your body, but completely in fragmentations, like, mm -hmm. which is true throughout your work. And then Hina, yeah. if we can go to your work, something I find really amazing about your work is when you talk about the process and how the work grew, you, you talk about this she in your work as like a separate being. And you talk about how as someone who was trained in miniature painting for years, she didn't have a face. And then she slowly started, then you started practicing faces and she started resembling you. Or you even talk about like the year where she turned her face and there's something like intense and spiritual about that. But you also talk about the stigma of the nude body 
and having it present, having it take space, especially when you think of showing work back home too. And I feel like this, like the, this hero of your, someone recently called me a Shiro and I was like, I don't like the word Shiro, but that's, that's a side <laughs> question. But the protagonist of your work at the center, it, it refers to your body enough for me to be like, you dared to paint her nude, but then she is this mythical creature that has her own existence. So yeah, thoughts on the self and self-portraiture, all of you, anyone. Um, I feel like, and so I've spent so long just like combing through all these conversations on the Facebook group of subtle Asian traits. So I know it's not just me, but I think for a lot of Asian Americans, there's always this question of like, where is home or like, who am I? Um, and I sort of like the way I think about it, it's kind of like this child who goes to kindergarten and they feel like they totally belong. But then like, as they get mm. older, they're told about like the other factors, like the outside mm. factors that play into their belonging. So like, who are your neighbors? who are your parents, like the location in mm. which you live. Um, and then, so there's this feeling that like you totally belong, but then the outside world is telling you something else. And so it's like this constant questioning um, that's like able to create this like sense of self, right? Um, mm. And I don't know, maybe in trying to fit in and like wanting to belong, like one has to find this, like constantly find this middle ground between either mm. like East and West culture, like, the difference between like parents generation and yours um mm. like and like constantly like assimilating mm. um that I don't know must like feed into this idea of like the self-doubt or something mm. do you do you feel like you experienced that more doing the self-portraits or it became clear or or it was present um maybe just faces you to like confront it more mm um obviously mm. in a mirror mm. versus like you can mm. put it off um I think that's mm. also maybe why like I was trying to like avoid going to self-portraiture for the longest mm. time like the idea of staring to a mirror for long hours was like like really daunting mm. <laughs> maybe for some people they love it but. <laughs> um and then uh Gina can you tell us more about the fragmentation of your body the repetition of the image um yeah yeah, I mean, I was thinking about um, how using my own body or my own face gave me a, a level of freedom um, to pursue some ideas that I had, you know, because I, I, for a long time, was appropriating images from the internet. And so then I started to have ideas like, I want a Jackson Pollock lip, and like, that doesn't exist. So I have to make it myself. And it just like opened up all of these possibilities for me. Um, so it kind of represents freedom in that way. Um, mm. But I also think like it, it's referencing, um, cause I have some works in my new show that where I'm painting on my face as well. And that's just sort of referencing all of the face painting that is, that I see in my feed. Um, there's mm. so, you know, like there was a time when I would go to my discover page on Instagram and it was like, all people with multiple eyes like all over their faces you know um so it's also just like bringing in that element of mm. uh, just like a, a pop cultural practice that's like ongoing mm. it's so fascinating too it's like part of my brain as i was trying to um negotiate or I couldn't fact check that it was your body because like I couldn't find it in print <laughs> yeah. anywhere yeah. and I was like does the video exist like is there because you can uh -huh. almost imagine I'm interested in like the DIY self you know it's like yeah it can follow how you do this for some yeah. reason yeah. yeah I actually in my talk I, I show a photo of myself it's so ridiculous because you know I just crop my lips out but I all the photos are like me, like this at the screen with like a paintbrush. <laughs> it's like really nuts. So, but I just, I just, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, hey, but do you want to tell us about um, your relationship with self-portraiture? Yeah, I guess like, um, I, I feel like I gravitated towards it very intuitively as a kid. Um, mm but there was so much shame around it. Like the first time I, I like did a 
did a, a new night game and I showed it to someone. I got I got like um, I was told told a few things, said, told a few words. I'm not going to repeat here, but mm. it was like a lot of shaming around it, and I just didn't understand it, you know, because mm. like I didn't understand why uh, the body was so charged. This was like mm. I was I was firstly I was like 16. Mm, I never dated, mm. so I didn't really understand the idea of it being charged because of sex and sex being taboo. I was just like, wow, your body is like super, super shameful. Mm. Mm. Um, and that really stayed with me. And I think um, I just uh, also felt, uh, just always felt like I had to, I had to make it. Um, and mm. maybe it was just a rebellion, like, which is still present um, uh, that, or like the need to assert uh, some part of myself, mm-hmm. which was not accepted, or just mm-hmm. the need to accept that part of myself because like growing up with so much rejection of it, mm-hmm. um, of like mm-hmm. just being a woman in uh, like such a hev- heavily patriarchal society. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, maybe it was just coming to terms with it. So like, mm-hmm. so yeah. Like, yeah. no one ever says, like, Lucian Freud nude portraits. No one's ever like, oh, how shameful. They're like, yeah, he's a badass, you know. <laughs> you can it see all. it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's really different um, than you're a man painting, a woman. Like, I know that at this point, yeah, of course, uh, there is a lot of talk. Like, if a man is painting a woman in grad school, there's a conversation yeah. about why are you doing this. But back in the day, that was accepted. And... Um, yeah. Culturally, like in Pakistan, women don't paint themselves or other women mm. nude, even if they dare paint or get a mm. job or whatever. So it just kind of became like um, a, par- a part of me. And I think I was mm. just dealing with my own physical like issues and I was mm. unable to express them in a physical way. So they were all just coming out in the art. Mm. Um, so that was my, I think that's always kind of been my connect with yeah. with painting um there were no faces because i was kind of terrified that if i paint myself they'll be like oh my god if i paint someone else she'll be really pissed <laughs> <laughs> so, um and eventually i think it came down to me thinking what do i know best like in the world mm. from being from painting and i was like well i i know myself best and even that i barely know and I'm sure mm. you can relate to that at, at some level. Um, but mm. yeah, and then uh, when I started painting faces and then I realized she was looking like me, then I started deliberately painting myself and it was still like mm. all these profiles, like in that that girl mm. uh, hanging over there. Uh, that was Alita and the Swan painting, which I cut the head of the swan off and turned her into an angel. Mm. And then I got her out of the paper. That was like the first, I think, original cutout that I, mm. I made. And that was, that was a direct self-portrait. But it was, it was mm. too much for me to watch her in the whole mm. swan situation, uh, hence the head chopping. Um, yeah. So And then um, it kind of changed. Like her face, after I started painting myself, her face took on like many different faces. And I feel like mm. it's still... There is still a resemblance, but I don't identify with her in the same way. In the miniatures, it's much more a narrative self-portrait at a very Mm. emotional level. But when the works grow Mm. in scale, I feel like they hold a lot more space Mm. for a lot more people and a lot Mm. more identities and a lot more female energy, which just generally is Mm. a huge part of my life. I mean, it is interesting. I feel like there's so much spirituality in your work where it's interesting how she becomes inviting. Um, It makes me think about the way you talk about um, your studio as a space for others to come and talk to. It's also very interesting to think about the legacy of miniature and not focusing on the individual. And then what does it mean to have this figure both finding its individuality but also maintaining the spirituality that's Um, really interesting that you say that because like 
just trying to figure out where to sign the large paintings because in the mm. position you hide like a tiny signature and the painting is not about you the painting is supposed to be about the painting and the artist is a non-entity mm. for like a decade and a half you're like i am a non-entity in a vessel <laughs> and then the next 10 years you're like i am gonna paint these big nudes and then there's like, like this balance because you're like can i paint these big nudes and and be like i'm a human being and a woman and that's okay mm -hmm. but also like mm -hmm. somehow leave or at least like mm -hmm. try to observe the ego separate from the painting mm -hmm. being a painting like i feel like it becomes mm -hmm. such a balancing act because as, as artists like we are all kind of creators but mm -hmm. so much of what we are painting is just like it's happening and we're just there mm -hmm. <laughs> And it's yeah. right? <laughs> nodding because she's like, that's exactly what happens in my <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you just, um, yeah, time is super weird and you have plans mm. for things and how things will be. And then, then they just are. And you're like, okay, well, this is the painting. Like, <laughs> you know, and uh, um, yeah, I mm. get it. <laughs> It's so fascinating that like in these talks, I'm like, it's interesting just like talking to makers where I'm like, language will destroy what happened. You know, mm -hmm. it's like to be a maker, to, to have it kind of um, find its own way or to have that negotiation with it. I also, you made me think about Spivak and something I read but didn't understand. I promised myself I'm not gonna mention her. So we're not gonna go there. <laughs> not gonna go there. Uh, I said the same thing in my last talk, I think too. Um, so, but that brings me to my very general uh, last question, which is like mostly an invitation before we open up for the Q&A. But I feel like each of you are very, like you're painting nerds. Like there's very specific <laughs> ways where you're thinking about the history of painting and push and pull, like do this dance with it. Um, so I just want to, open this conversation and uh, consider your mediums. Like Suzanne, I've been thinking a lot about your relationship with colors, but even the same first painting we looked when you make references to all these painters that inspired you, or even what you just mentioned about your relationship to landscape. Uh, Gina, I'm really interested in how you work with reliefs, the idea of what becomes sculptural or the thickness of the paint and these flirtations you're doing with these like giant abex bros. Um, and Heba, I think I've already mentioned this like over and over again, but I'm interested in your relationship with the history of miniature, but also the medium itself. I feel like you sometimes talk about working with tea and I already mentioned like rituals and tea, um, but also thinking about the likeness of it. Like there's something that like allows me, like it has a different weight to it for me. I'm going to stop. Any thoughts on painting? Yeah, I mean, I, I think like I'm, I am a painting nerd. Like I love painting. Um, I, but then I also think that I kind of hate painting. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I wouldn't make, you know, I definitely have a complicated relationship with it or else I wouldn't make like things that are basically not non-painting painting. You know, like mm. I'm trying, I'm trying to upend it in this way because I feel too restricted by it. Um, mm. At the same time, I'm like a, a total fan. So mm. it's like, it's, it could be in both positions kind of at once. Where, and I think what's yeah. fascinating, like so far we've talked a lot about the content of your work, but like on a material level, I think it's really interesting that you work with these images that we often think about the surface and flatness. And so much yeah. of your work is about like, not only the texture but like the gravity of paint it's like what does it mean for it to take space i think sometimes when people are writing about your work they have this moment of like no you have to stand in front of it because mm -hmm. there's like all these yeah, ways that it pokes and it moves yeah uh, for sure i mean i think i i mean i think that 
honestly the relief for me and not to go back to social media, but it is yeah. about this sort of connection and communication across a space. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like screaming at you like, Hey, yeah. you know, like, um, yeah. And I also think like it, you know, we, people associate the internet as flat, but obviously yeah. there's so much going on that is human and it has a beating heart, you know, like yeah. it doesn't, it, it's not flat. I mean, it's an entire other reality. Like Susan is mm. meeting, uh, you know, her sitters through it and forming these, mm. you know, like it's, it's a real living, breathing world. Mm. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't feel, I don't experience this as flat necessarily. Mm. And also mm. when he was talking about um, uh, meeting so many people in the art world and like having mm. this like social sphere, I mean, that, that is so important. It's such a like affirming kind of life affirming thing, you know. Um, I'm knocking on wood. 2020 is a lot. <laughs> there is something positive. Uh, and I think there was lightning behind you here, but the moment I said positive. <laughs> lightning. Do you guys have the lightning? Are you? Oh, yeah. we have the wind here. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> like, oh my God. Yeah. out of control. <laughs> um, Susan and Heba, do you want um, to, to share some painterly nerdy things with me? I, I feel like one of my favorite things about painting is, well, one, it's like this never ending abyss and like you're in mm. one smoky room and then once it's cleared, it means like you can enter the next smoky room and it kind of <laughs> just goes on forever. But there is like something about working in representation mm. that I've noticed is like, uh, like there are times where you're like, oh, I really want this painting to look like the person mm. but like sometimes you enter this weird zone where the painting just kind of takes off on its own and like rather than restricting it you just kind of let it um and so like it might not even end up looking like what you wanted it to be at the beginning but you just kind of like you kind of have to like go with it and like I think that's like my favorite part when it happens like this it's not mm. like spiritual but it's kind of like oh something is happening that's like not even in my control and like you mm. should just let it happen I should have had a whole phase on talking about failure but we're out of <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time for failure uh, and capitalism yeah. wins. Uh, Eva, uh, tell me about tea and painter. Yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, miniature painting was like so different. Uh, it is so specific. And one of the techniques we learn in it is painting with tea. And that is mostly tea. It's not usually, it doesn't usually have so much color. This is more of an adaptation, but... Uh, yeah, so I mean, we drink a lot of tea as well. Like a miniature mm. studio is like, imagine like a room full of white rugs and white cushions and just like these huge tube lights hanging over your head. There are no mm. shoes. Everyone sits on the floor. They're like, there's like your shells and then there's your tea and it's all this like strange stuff. Um, and then the only food that comes in is the tea, the actual mm. chai, which is like bossed around and everyone drinks it. Mm. I think as kids, like we have um, in Pakistan, at least, we have such a strong association with tea. Like I started drinking tea when I was a few years old. <laughs> I sit in my grandfather's lap and he'd give me little teaspoons of chai. And um, yeah, I've just been drinking it ever since. Mm. And so mm. it's kind of like a meditation almost. You know, you cook it, you make it into paint. Um, mm. And the whole process of like layering it and working with the translucency of it is mm -hmm. just very mm -hmm. kind of meditative, like therapy. Mm -hmm. um, Good mixture of therapy and addiction. I feel like in Iran, we <laughs> usually drink black tea and I'm like, I don't, I don't know how much we can take of it. Um, okay, um, on that note, shall we open for Q&A? Okay. Um, so anyone has more questions, please put it, um, in the group chat. Uh, I'm just looking to see what we have. I think a good starting point seems like Sheila has had some questions and uh, Sheila has been my teacher. So I'm excited to hear her thoughts. Uh, so if anyone, Sheila, do you want to pose the questions? We'll try to find you and unmute you. Yeah. Hi. 
take away the surprised look. <laughs> the evening light look. Um, How are you? Good. I've just had some uh, things along the way, like this idea of space. Hmm. You know, I think it's important to note that we, you know, since we inherited E equals MC squared, we must acknowledge that space is hmm. um, time space. Hmm. And that mm -hmm. in the internet, we're simply living in time space, but without matter, without mm -hmm. gravity. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we start thinking of space that way. Said by someone who's devoted to hand making things, <laughs> way, but who mm -hmm. also loves and affirms this way mm -hmm. of connection um, mm -hmm. For radically different reasons, because it allows easy connection and human connection yeah. across mm. many. Like 80s and 90s um, precedents of oh. pulling things out of context and putting them on blank grounds mm -hmm. that sets up um, the optical, the painting space that um, then the in, something like Instagram takes the place of, or like the choice of background color in um, Facebook. And so mm -hmm. I think, I think that's like, yeah. I don't know what you think about that. Linear. Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the things that happens is that Instagram social media is like a vacuum that I mean of like a vacuum cleaner that sucks mm. up all earlier artistic references I mean mm. uh, you know I make these paintings of lips and people say oh um, Marilyn Minter and I'm like yeah because um, social media has you know Marilyn Minter has entered like the pop culture in mm. such a way that it influences you know, I, I, I just no. to be quick about it. I want to invert that in that there is yeah. actually layers of artwork made pre social media that right. are actual precedents to your work. That's that what well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying yeah. that social media, I'm pulling from social media. Right. Social media is pulling from these earlier mm. artists. I, well, I'm have, saying that affected the internet that's what yeah. i was trying to say but i know yeah. but what i'm trying to say is a lot of the examples i don't think you can find in the same way on social media because right. of right because right. they don't exist in a thumbs up yeah zone. they yeah, just yeah. exist in time yeah and then i'm just having a little forum here <laughs> <laughs> no but it was also interesting because I guess another way we can think about all three of your work is how you think about time. Whether it's like what inspires you to make the work and how you deal with the process of making. I think that's fascinating too. So yeah. I want to go away, but I also <laughs> want to say to Hiba and, um, sorry, Susan, um, there are the one is what it's like to grow up in an extremely um conservative family it's mm. it's it's like i it's just astounding how much shame there is for women mm. in uh i would say abrahamic <laughs> conservative religion families in mm. general it's just astounding and mm. keep keep the good faith um, and Susan, there's a comment in there about you. I'm, I was really interested in how many paintings of groups you have before, and that, you know, seems to be something that Westerners are not really that mm. interested in, unless mm. you're Dutch. You know, like that <laughs> you have a group of people mm. that you care about, mm. and so, so mm. there's if you read the chat, that's for you. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bye, guys. So good to Bye. see you. Um, <laughs> I believe we had a question from John K. Uh, should we try unmuting? I don't know if you're still here. Um, if 
I'm here. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hey. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the talk so much. Thank you so much Thank for you. having us. Um, I had a question about process. I mean, everyone talked about, you know, how they come to their work, talked about space, talked about time. But I want to talk, I guess, more technically about how you create your work. How long does it take you to make your work? And I know with Eba, you recently switched to oil painting or, or added it to your practice. And I've like seen you talk about things on social media, but I would just love to hear about like how, ha how has that process been? And you know, yeah, I just want to talk about the materiality. And it, obviously with Gina, your work is way more three dimensional and it includes like various different types of materials. So um, anyways, I just want to talk about materiality and technical things and how long it takes you to make things. Yeah, Thank I you. personally am also really curious as to how, Gina, you get such like thick textures and whether there's like mm. sculptural practices like involved. And with Hiba, I see a lot of times you, you like use like big brush and you call it like a Swiffer brush. Um, mm. And I, I think that's really funny. Um, but I, I think for me, I'm like kind of a, like a straightforward painter. I start with drawings. Um, when sitters come in, I don't want to go into like a full-fledged like painting mode. And I think doing drawings of them kind of allows the sitter to Good like point. ease into a stu studio. Um, and yeah, and a lot of times I'll just go from painting like after the drawing. Just it, yeah. Um, yeah, I. Uh usually work from photos or Photoshop images. I'll like grid them out, draw them out. Um, and then it's a lot of layering acrylic and building up the acrylic, um, either with pigment or without pigment. Um, and then once it starts to dry, I cut, you know, I go back to the original image, I cut away, like you can use an X-Acto and like cut it away if it's not the right direction or something. Um, and then on my larger pieces, I've started to use high density foam underneath just because they were becoming like Richard Serra's or something. They were so heavy. So I use the foam and then I use the acrylic um, on top of it. But it is really more of a, it is sort of a sculptural process. Um, it just enables me to sort of like run interference while I'm copying this photo the material gets in the way and I have to sort of battle it, try to get to the original. Um, so it makes it, and in the process, like a, lang a painting language is born, kind of, if that mm. makes sense. I'm just curious, like I haven't ever tried acrylic. What is the drying time for that? Yeah, it, it depends. You can buy retarders and things that slow it down, but it's probably 30 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, I tried, like, I, I, I was always a watercolorist, um, and, uh, switched to oil last year, and, uh, luckily, everyone on social media is an oil painter, and so <laughs> we were like, we will help you do this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and Instagram. And, like, seriously, like, people were amazing, um, Everyone taught me stuff about the materials, where to get my canvases, where to get my linen, where to get my framing done, mm. what to use, what not to use. Otherwise, there was no way I would have even completed one painting by now. Um, but it, it's been like kind of intense. Like I made the switch because I was having a really, really bad year. And uh, I like took my aggression out on a wall and then I couldn't paint miniatures. <laughs> And I was like, I was like, the paper is not absorbing like my my uh, energy right now because paper is delicate and it's also something I knew so well. Um, and I had like a lot of excess energy. And um, so I went one day and I just bought the biggest canvas they had at Artists and Craftsmen. By the way, ninety six inches is the biggest craftsman <laughs> canvas you can buy, like on site, and they deliver it the next day. If anyone ever wants to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, like super frustrating. Found out in two months I'm allergic to everything petroleum based. So <laughs> totally had to cut it down after becoming tachycardic. Of course, if you're a moron and you paint in a dress, 
and then you have like oil paint on your legs and you're like wiping it off the turpentine if it had to happen but I didn't know it was toxic like I was used to watercolor um so now I just use like uh spike lavender um and I use uh, walnut oil and oil paint and that's it and trying time please help me huge painting and it's not even yeah. drying and i don't know cat yeah. dries so slow yeah. and finally like yesterday i put on my judy chicago mask thank you judy chicago <laughs> and uh i started like uh i, I got some gal kit and i put it in the paint because it dries it faster and i tried that but and then I opened all the windows and I ran, I ran away before anything happened. Um, but it's still wet. And yeah. the are coming on Tuesday and I have no idea what I'm doing, by the way. Like, yeah, well, I think like, a, I, w I think a lot of painting, painters deliver works that are wet, who work oil, with oil. I don't, oh, I don't think that you're alone. Yeah, in fact, I, I remember reading something about like, maybe like Jackson Pollock or Rauschenberg or someone who had like, like there was like a wet surface in this major show or something. So don't, I mean, the only thing is figuring out how to like put a collar on it so it doesn't smudge or something, you know, but I, I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. yeah I, I did give them a heads up at the gallery. I was like, listen, yeah. I don't know yeah. what's going on, but <laughs> yeah. good luck. Yeah. <laughs> John, you asked the best question. We got some real answers. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thank I you. love all of you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a bunch of good questions, but I'm going to, um, I think we only have time for one more. Uh, so, Malvika, if you want to take over for the last question. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I'm going to go rogue. I, I had a question that was about sort of the state and like the national project, the national project of miniature painting, but mm. I'll ask a different question. Sure, yeah. <laughs> question. Um, Hiba, this is sort of for you, but more broadly. Um, I guess like I, okay, I, I, I follow you on Instagram. I love seeing your studio space and the kind of like multiplicity of women you know, of which you are one key part and how it creates this kind of like altered, deeply, deeply atmospheric space of your studio. And then it always reminds me a little of like, by contrast, the space of women in the more historical miniatures, which is like a much more interior space or like on the bed or on the roof, also in states of repose, but kind of in relation to a whole scene. Mm -hmm. um, and and then because I, because it's like, I'm watching a beautiful video, it makes me also think of like Sultana's dream and like kind of, um, kind of queer, kind of utopian reading of like a separate mm -hmm. women's, uh, like a, like a women's revolution, a women's world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I guess I, it feels like, you know, kind of like out of the women's quarter have spilled out all these bodies and like everything else is wiped away. Um, and to me, me when I read it I get very or when I look at your work on like on the IG uh to me I get very excited because I it reminds me of all of these themes that are like a little bit women's and separatist and like a little bit queer maybe a little bit utopian and I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you do you feel like is a kind of utopian or like separatist or like queer subtext mm -hmm. your work is that or like like clearly a world of women, not all of them exact replicas of you, but a lot of people creating this space that is also not including any of the other stuff that happens in this world. It's been like blown up. Like, is there kind of a, is there like a, is there like a politics or a utopia to it? I'm gonna, um, just for fun, expand more because, or try to expand more because question to everyone a bit. Um, but yeah, any ideas on uh, kind of revolutions and kind of utopias in, in your work? I think probably for all of us to a level, um, like I can see why, why you asked me that because um, this, the place where we come from as um, 
like from a culture uh, where women are not seen that often, um, it is pro it is definitely this the space is definitely meant to be a safe space for women, mm. um, and that's very intentional. And the studio is meant to be a safe space for women. I mean, it's energetically it's very um, um, safe. I made a little protector angel as well for all of us. Uh, for everyone who visits, but it's just, yeah, it's meant to be like a, a space that is, um, I mean, the, the normal world is very, um, is very different for people who are different. Like, I think, I think it is not understood in, in an adequate way. The other is like, a is not, um, like I've never really understood how to phrase it. I think we mm. all feel it. I think everyone who has gone through uh, any kind of, um, or has lived through any kind of space in which they are not completely the norm or accepted for whatever whatever reason, whether it's like gender, race, uh, sexuality, you know, how you identify, where you're from, um, your, your, just your accent is different. Like, I think we all identify with that a little bit. And I feel like with time, um, even though initially when I started, the work was very much trying to figure out my own connection with, uh, with my body, it very, um, it just expanded to be kind of like a, a space, um, like a, a utopian, like you're saying, is a space of, um, safety and protection mm. and healing and i really want i don't know i don't know how it happens but i kind of want the paintings to hold that and i don't even know uh, i don't know maybe gina and, and susan have a better answer to this but like you know there's that whole thing when you're making a painting or you're making any kind of art form there's like this time when you're just making it or you're learning how to make it like when i was, did the first oil painting by the way worst painting ever um, you don't yet know how to put content in it because you're too busy figuring out the making part. But then I also wonder, like, there's our conscious content, right? Like, you're consciously looking at makeup tutorials, but then you're also using your body, and then you're also fragmenting your body. And there are so many unconscious parts to that painting. Mm -hmm. And so the content that we put into our work... Um, I think when it's left, it is very unintentional. And so part of me has always wondered, like, how, how do we, like, create intentionally? How, like, how do you live consciously? How do you create intentionally? And uh, so, I, like, in my mind, I'm like, well, you know, I'm just going to make the intention. Mm. And let's see what happens. But there's got to be, like, a way that people... <laughs> We all approach it differently. We're wrapping on on some simple things: intentionality, <laughs> revolutions, and oh, maybe utopia. Um, final thoughts, Gina, Susan. Yeah, I, I was just. Oh, oh, you go. You go, 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 Susan. Oh, well, I was really short. Uh, yeah, I was just ahead. saying how, like, I don't know. I think of how, like, women were not allowed to participate in, like, salons or in painting studios or academic painting classes until like the late 18 or maybe like the early 1900s and so just by like doing this it's like you're part of a revolution you know just by like yeah. making you're like yeah. part of a mm. movement so yeah to paint or nerd that's yeah that's <laughs> kind of what I, that's what I was that's what I was gonna say also but also this idea you'll see like lately uh, well, just in, in political discourse, like I am enough, you know, this mm -hmm. idea of I am enough. And I, mm -hmm. I feel like that's, that's a current in all of mm -hmm. our, our work um, is just mm -hmm. this like self acceptance. Um, mm -hmm. and, and also just like for the world, like, you know, I'm enough. Don't, don't try to tell me I'm not, you know, <laughs> that kind of attitude. Yeah. There's a vulnerability to that. Um, mm -hmm you like take that space and you're like, well, I'm painting my body or this is my mouth and mm -hmm. that's cool. Like it's mm -hmm. okay. 
it's like yeah. it's really okay that I'm using <laughs> my own mouth for this. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's a that's a good place to wrap up. If we all feel comfortable. Uh, once again, thank you for being part of this talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I feel like I'm now a secondhand painter, painting nerd, <laughs> maybe. Uh, and once again, thanks to the gallery for making this possible. Go see these people's works because they're amazing and badass and maybe revolution and utopia, maybe. Uh, and if you feel like unmuting yourself to say goodbye, please feel free to do so. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much Thanks, for joining. Yeah. Thank you guys for participating. Yeah. It means a lot. Thank you, Susan. Congrats to Thank everyone. You, <laughs> of course, of course. Hey, yeah. I, I'm just beginning. What are the details of the show? When does it open <laughs> in person? What's up? Um, I know that Gina's show opens in September, right? Is there a specific date? So Is far, it's the 15th. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's yeah. Marianne Bosky Gallery. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then Heba's opening at Debuck Gallery on okay. the 3rd, right? The 3rd oh, of September? Cool. Third. Yes. <laughs> and they gave us their time, which I really appreciate. Uh, and Susan's show is currently open. Okay. Yeah, till the 19th of September. Yeah. Art to see in person. Painting to see in person. I'm excited. Do you think it would way. ever happen it's again? Like we're seeing again. Yeah. I know MoMA is now open and like oh. museums are having people in. So it looks so, like we're all going to have some interaction. Uh, I think we said okay. revolution too many times and now like the storm is taking over. As we're like, we're going to make changes. John has um, a show coming up too, right? What? You have a show coming up as well, right? Yes, I have an online show actually with Steve Turner Gallery. LOL. Oh, Shout out to me. <laughs> actually, with Jared, it's with my twin Jared Key. So oh, we're having a cool. duet show, oh uh, which is going to be super exciting. That's really awesome. Fun. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Nick. You're on mute. I just noticed that you don't seem mute. Congrats, y'all. Thanks for this wonderful Hi. Oh, <laughs> Thank you for letting me put you on spot. There was a good amount of, like, rail people. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, thank right. you for well, so thank you. Your thank time. you. Okay. Yeah, Bye, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Yasi. Of course. Amazing. My pleasure. <laughs>